Before we start, please know that today's event is being interpreted into English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Please join your preferred language channel by clicking on the interpretation globe on your icon bar. The icon bar can be found on the bottom of your screen on laptops and can be found by clicking the three dots if you are joining from a smartphone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. For some, this is very early morning and for others, it is the close of day. Welcome and thank you for making time to join this CSW 66 parallel event. My name is Glenda McQueen and I'm a priest in the Episcopal Church of Panama in Central America. And I serve as partnership officer for Latin America and the Caribbean with the global partnership staff. I participated in the resilience course that was offered by Anglican Alliance and Episcopal Relief and Development during 2020 and 2021. My interest in the course came from the fact that I live and serve in a region of the world where the risk of natural disasters and human-made disasters are part of our daily lives. Being able to understand resilience and disaster response brought knowledge and skills that allows me to better prepare, support, and coordinate with local responders in dioceses and regions. To those, today's panel is entitled Contextual Learning Exchanges, Elevating Gender Empowerment Through Online Platforms. The COVID pandemic created conditions that push churches and organizations involved in climate resilience training and human development to transfer to virtual mode their learning opportunities by using online platforms for their programs and to achieve their goals. Do these online platforms support contextual learning? And do they further the costs of gender justice, gender empowerment? Or do they inhibit the, and perpetuate hierarchical pattern, patterns? Today, we will hear from four amazing panelists who will share from their experiences as participants and faculty of the Resilience and Disaster Response online course. They are Mercio Langa, a social development practitioner based in Mozambique. Vesta Oduru Quarteng, a program associate based in Ghana. Snow Ning Ning Ai, a lecturer at a theological college based in Myanmar. Donna Louise William, a high school teacher based in St. Lucia. Please, uh, as we begin the, to listen to our panelists, uh, remember that in the chat, you can write your questions and uh, post them there in the language with, uh, of which you're comfortable. So um, let, let us just begin by, by hearing from our panelists. I'll introduce them by saying that uh, participants were men and women from diverse contexts, formation and life experience, which they brought with them to the course. Participants lived in the Middle East, in Latin America, in Africa, Asia. There were Pacific Islanders and others that came from the Caribbean islands and maybe other regions. Some participants were professionals form in the fields such as health, planning, law, education, and community organizing. Their ages range uh, from young adults 
to seniors. Our four, first panelist will be Mercio. Mercio Langa. And this question is for you. Can you tell us how you saw the course design and structure allow for inclusion and diversity? Did it facilitate the participants of other voice, the participation of other voices? Thank you, Glenda. My name is Mercio Langa, and I'm a permanent deacon at the Anglican Church based in Maputo, the capital of Mozambique in the southern part of Africa. I'm married and I have two children, aged 11 and 6. My area of interest is in social development and theological praxis. I have music as my passion. It's a privilege and honor to be sharing with you on the topic of course design and structure. And I hope that my experience as one of the facilitators of the resilience course will inspire and challenge all of us to continue engaging with gender and gender issues using online platforms. Again, I will be sharing on the course design and structure, which is for me an integral component of the success of the course. The resilience course was a great platform for learning and sharing. It was designed for lay leaders as well as ordained ministers in leadership with the purpose of equipping the church with capacity to prepare and respond to disasters during and after they occur. Because of the historical dominant male participation in courses like these, this online course was designed and structured to disrupt that dominance, which was aggravated by the fact that physical meetings, trainings, conferences, and workshops were attended by men, which also happened in church contexts. This was the case because of the misunderstanding of women's position in society, the inferior consideration that was given to them, most of it informed by religion throughout history. The reason why till today, in context of Africa, most church leadership is male dominant. Nevertheless, in the past 10 years or so, we have assisted an attempt by churches in balancing the gender as far as leadership and attendance is concerned. One key aspect of the course design and structure was the multiple languages in which the resilience course was offered. There were in total six different languages and learners from 43 countries from around the globe. It was a one year course from November 2020 to November 2021, observing breaks for liturgical celebrations of New Year's, Lent and Easter, as well as mid-year break. The course was structured in a way to accommodate various time zones and people's agenda to mean that each learner had a pool of options to attend the course. English was the primary mode of communication in all courses. And of course, in all courses, there were interpreters in local languages. This allowed learners to participate fully in their own languages. And so being freedom of expression was a reality. The course was evaluated as inclusive as many voices that were silenced or purposely unheard by the male dominant system were very active, coupled, coupled with the fact that learners who had limitations in English could speak in their own language. By active, I mean that women voice reclaimed its space and place within the dialogue that concerns them too. Because gender is not only about women, such voices echo the experience of men in their contexts that were not unheard because of the social construction or on model that defined what men should be, do, or say. Meaning inclusion in gender 
brought a whole lot of voices that are responding to resilience in various areas, not only climate. There is no way to talk about resilience without the experience told by those who are at the forefront of the responses. Some specific, specific examples are the keynote speakers, leaders in small group discussions, facilitators, and the fact that there was an atmosphere of respect and equal engagement that indicated that inclusion allowed such activity, such active participation by the unheard voices. Although some of the opinion that online learning may have the same asymmetrical gender and power dynamics as traditional face-to-face -face learning environments with male students displaying dominant, controlling, arrogant, and other deviant uh, behavior, the resilience course in our experience proved that online platforms are disrupting hierarchies through inclusion. Inclusion meaning the space that is created of voices to be heard. In physical platforms, it was testified that is hardly an inclusive event, as will be only the senior leadership, which in most cases are male to participate. It allowed for anyone from anywhere to contribute and express oneself in a language that suits him or her, mostly with the aid of an interpreter. That leads to affirm the diversity within the participants from different countries, cultures, languages, and backgrounds. Still in the topic of diversity, there were guest speakers and keynote presenters from various contexts, which enriched the discussions and challenged critical thinking from participants or viewers. The key finding about the guest speakers is that in their intervention, the need for more balanced gender inclusion or discussion was patent in their interventions. The speakers were from different contexts, but with similar experience that led for that identical stand for balance and inclusion and the same dynamic was also felt within the faculty members. I guess addressing online is a safe space for advocating issues that in some physical spaces would be a bit uncomfortable. The way the sessions were designed and structured allowed rich contributions from like-minded people, regardless of their geography, position in church, level of influence or academic background. One clear example of this was when during a breakout group discussions where a similar contribution regarding the church's prophetic voice came out strongly from learners from Mozambique, Brazil, and Angola. This unified understanding from different contexts enriched more the discussions and the way forward in a more collective way. All were learners and felt free to contribute. The resilience course in our online platform was a space for balanced distribution of roles on breakout room discussions and group members. The online course was a platform to assure gender integration in, re in, re in resilience discussions. Looking to African context, most decisions were done by male leadership regarding challenges that women are leading the responses. Looking to most of the course sessions and topics, it was acknowledged that the male dominant intervention was not enough to assure resilient actions. That most of the response came from women on the ground and in communities doing the planning and implementation of actions. Another key aspect of the structure was the timing, which was monthly sessions. This was intentional to allow participants who also have their own agendas to manage and balance their commitment to the course. In between sessions, there were homeworks which encouraged learning and implementation of sharing for sustainability. Well, some recommendations regarding the design structure given to the course and perhaps can be a lesson learned for other organizations that may want to 
to run a course using similar structure is to be cautious of the length. The resilience course was 12 months, and for some learners, it was too long. Nevertheless, the design and structure proved to work, and as far as gender balance and resilience discussion is concerned, it was a space of leverage. For me, the resilience course was a great experience as a faculty member and facilitator, but also as someone who was learning from the various experiences shared. It impacted my journey as a minister and social development practitioner, enriching my knowledge and being more capable to assist local communities with preparedness, mitigation, and disaster response in a resilient way. I will recommend to many others to join in their upcoming opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mercio, for highlighting how the design and structure of this online course created space for the inclusion of those often unheard voices to be heard. Know that women are often excluded from participating at decision-making meetings and training courses that occur outside of their villages, towns, city, or even their country. That imply travel for several days or weeks or where considerations for childcare responsibilities need to be made as well as how long they can be away from their jobs and the effect this will have on their family economy. We can add to the fact that in many cases, the programs are being offered in English and not in their native language. Our second panelist will be Vesta Odoru Quarteng. Vesta, in terms of the technology, meaning the online platforms, where did you see barriers broken? And when did you see barriers remaining? Thank you, Glenda, and greetings to all here gathered, including my fellow panelists. My name is Vesta Odru Kwarteng, a staff of Episcopal Relief and Development, serving in the capacity as a program associate. I am based in the Africa Regional Office in Ghana. I will situate our conversation in the context of the use of technology and how it impacted the resilience course. If for nothing at all, COVID-19 has taught us to be more adaptable in executing projects and the resilience course of which I was fortunate to be part of, serving as a member of faculty and course secretariat is no exception. Per the prior plan for course execution, the intention was to have an in-person training, inviting participants to a location for learning, but the COVID-19 pandemic made this impossible to achieve. However, course organizers looked for an alternative, which was adapting a new way of facilitating and accompanying learners to be, still, to be able to still go through the course, learning and sharing knowledge from various regions across the globe. This is what birthed the resilience course, co-managed by the Anglican Alliance and Episcopal Relief and Development. The use of technology was a major asset for the execution of a successful course. Majority of us, if not all, today use technology in our work schedules, as well as achieving major tasks in our various organizations. As indicated earlier, the onset of the pandemic made course organizers use technology, specifically online platforms, as a vehicle for the implementation of a successful course. First and foremost, through the use of technology by way of advertising the course via social media, we got a large audience with about 40% female enrollments who shared rich experiences from countries which could have 
only be heard of in the news per one's geographic location. From our list of participants, we had a good number of female participants who probably might have not had the opportunity to travel to attend this course were it to be an in-person training. The intention of course organizers was to create learning opportunities for all and not to restrict the course to only those who had the time, the means, their, their position or portfolio to attend an in-person training. A free online course at your desk or from the comfort of your home or geographic location and at your very own fingertips was too good a course to allow to slide. Convenience at its highest peak. However, it required staying focused and persevering, especially for mothers with young children who had to juggle between learning, working and taking care of families, as opposed to having to leave their homes and family for a number of days to a designated location to attend an in-person training. Many leverage the opportunity, especially colleagues in the Anglican and Episcopal churches who wanted to build their knowledge in disaster preparedness, response and resilience. Following the end of the course, a large network base has been built in being learners, creating the opportunity to collaborate and co-learn from each other. This could or would foster in the near future peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, moving from regions and continents to learn and adapt or adopt best practices to their own context or settings. The use of technology also means that visa acquisition was no longer an issue if one was to participate in a virtual training. For example, in some parts of the world, acquiring a visa to travel to attend a training in some countries is sometimes more challenging for women. People can apply way in advance and still not have their visa applications approved to enable them attend a training in person. With technology, visa application almost seem like a thing of the past. Once you have your sign-in details, internet, a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone, you are good to go. In the same vein, the use of technology also enabled a wide range of speakers from different geographic locations to share experiences from their context, which meant that new voices were heard from the usual. Google Meet, Zoom, and other meeting apps have served us all well one way or the other, especially this current times. And for the resilience core, Zoom was the preferred option. The use of technology, the use of breakout rooms, plenary translation booths, and chat options were but a few of the features that the course utilized. Breakout rooms served as spaces where people could be vulnerable and share experiences without having to look back and think if it was safe to do so because in using technology, it is only the plenary sessions that is recorded. Due to the multilingual nature of the course, translations was available using the translation booth. All we needed to do was to change to the preferred translation channel and ensure that this was retreated re as the sessions were ongoing. It was also highly cost effective to use technology in this training. For example, Though translators were employed to translate, it meant that they would also be translating sitting in the countries or places of residence as opposed to if they were, they had to travel, feeding, accommodation costs, etc. were all curtailed. Participants, on the other hand, could also ask or seek clarity using their own native tongue, which allowed for easy understanding of the course. Again, with technology, there was no need for travel, feeding, accommodation costs for participants, as well as hiring a space or auditorium for the training. Those Zoom licenses came with a cost. It was relatively cheap as compared to all the other expenses that could have been incurred if this training was an in-person one. Every session of the course was video recorded, except for breakout rooms, and the recording 
was sent to all course participants at the end of each session. Participants who for a reason or two were absent at a session could catch up using the video recording as opposed to missing a session in an in-person training. Though one could catch up from training notes captured by a colleague, you could not benefit fully from what transpired during the entire session. Not only did the course leverage Zoom, other platforms like WhatsApp and emails were used to disseminate information and encourage further discussion of session topics, which has improved communications between learners. The community of female learners was strong, and there were vibrant offline conversation on WhatsApp and email to continue the discussion from the course. Responses from participants from an initial internal evaluation conducted at the end of the course showed that though the use of technology was highly effective, there were few setbacks per the context of the course. Some negatives that arose included the following. The designers of the course assumed that all participants were technology savvy. That is, all learners had some technological know-how, but that was not the case entirely. Though some, of, though some men struggled using technology, their female counterparts also struggled with some of the features of the platform leveraged. However, course designers are working to remedy this technological gap in future courses by ensuring that platforms created are user-friendly, comfortable, and familiar to use by all. Another negative on the use of technology is that not all participants had good internet connectivity and access, thereby some learners struggled to stay online for the whole duration of some sessions. The cost of internet was also quite expensive in some countries. However, participants as much as possible managed to complete the course and ended up receiving their course certificate. As indicated earlier, course organizers also ensured to record each session so that learners who had internet connectivity issues, as well as those who could not attend sessions due to circumstances beyond their control, could watch later to catch up on what was lost. The length of the course and the frequency of it could cause what is popularly known nowadays as Zoom fatigue. People got tired in Zoom rooms, but had to manage the situation. To salvage this, however, course organizers ensured to create learning sessions and content that were lively and very interactive, as well as breaks and ice breaks, ice breakers to ensure that learners were not Zoom fatigued. In concluding, I will say that technology is serving a great deal in this day and age for work, learning, entertainment, socialization, education, etc. It has served me well and is serving us all well today even at this event and beyond. Thank you. And I hand over to Glenda. Thank you, Vesta. We see that open invitation allowed anyone who was in interested in accessing the information and ap could apply. And that invitations were sent and resent by different groups and individuals. Participation in that course was not restricted to being nominated by a bishop or someone in the organization's leadership. It also meant women could see the invitation and decide for themselves if this fits their interests and needs. A wider pool of applicants included more women that could be considered for the course. And we were able to see that, yeah, there, there are some areas that still need to be worked on for future courses. Thank you very much, Vesta. And this allows us to, to listen to our, our next speaker. That is Snow Ning Ning Ai. Snow, will you tell us more about how the online course promoted the participation and leadership of women, how new leadership can be formed. And now that we have course alumni like you 
and also Donna and others, how can the course alumni mentor new leadership? Thank you, Glander. Minglaba. I am Nent Nene from Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. I am a lecturer of New Testament Studies at Holy Cross Theological College, Anglican College in Yango, Myanmar. As an Asia woman, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to participate and share my experiences at this panel, elevating gender empowerment through online platforms. Uh, if this panel is in person, event, and in overseas, I may not get this opportunity. Again, thank you very much to all the respected organizations who invite me today. And the face of Asia has two sides. One side is enriched in natural resources, but on the other side, there is injustice and discrimination to the vulnerable and marginalized group in social politics and religious spheres. As Myanmar has been deeply embedded in the patriarchal and hierarchical culture, so the church is also influenced by the culture. The church without criticizing the cultural teachings and discriminate women. Instead, accept these as a cultural must. So for example, though I am an educated and a lecturer at the Anglican College, Anglican Bible School, I am always in second class to criticize at social and, religi and religious fears. And the role of women uh, is within a boundary, within the limitations and the opportunities for women are the crumbs off from the table of milkshake. And also women are taught to be silent, only to speak and laugh softly and to walk slowly as virtuous feminine norms. Women are marginalized and critically rejected for the leadership role in Myanmar. As a result, many women internalize these ideas and think that they are physically, psychologically, and spiritually, they are inferior to men. And majority of Myanmar women uncritically accept male supremacy and females inferiority at home in religious and academic spheres and and also in the social community however the resilience course online training has changed my my own inferiority complex and highlight the psychological trauma of the hierarchical culture so i have attended course three which is mainly geared towards the uh, Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific regional group. In course three, there are 35 participants, both men and women from seven countries. And the powerful keynotes presentations and, uh, um, and from 10 topics and case study presentation from the regional participants enhanced new knowledges regarding resilience and uh, how we can respond uh, better accompanying the most vulnerable and marginalized communities during the crises and disasters. Since nearly all participants are from uh, Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific group, we can relate uh, each other's struggles, hardship and trauma caused by the natural and man-made disasters. So we have shared our experiences knowledge, then reflect and encourage uh, one another through the discussion times. And surprisingly, you know, women have more consistently participated to the end of the course uh, than men, of course, and submitted their homework assignments more than men. I am proud to be saying that. By seeing this woman have values value resilience uh, skill building afforded by this year-long online course. I have enjoyed this online course so much because there is no hierarchy uh, boundary and the facilitators uh, questions so much empower women's voices and allow us to see the capacities of women uh, for the local disaster uh, resilience program. And I have learned how 
um, how men and women in, in other parts of the world are building the community on disaster resilience and response better and after the disasters. Through this online course, um, many voices that were silenced are listened and heard. For example, women's experiences in domestic violence and cultural voices and structural voices are heard. As some presentations on the humanitarian program for the vulnerable and marginalized group became an example uh, for the uh, examples and resources strategy for another country. And for example, programs for Vanuatu in psychosocial support and gender-based violence in faith-based organizations are very, uh, very practical and effective platform uh, for the vulnerable group, especially to the survival women and uh, mothers uh, unions uh, from Vanuatu to have various training uh, projects uh, to the local leaders and church leaders who has a position to trust and give in care and pastoral uh, counseling to the local community. So mothers union in Myanmar uh, also has uh, the uh, GVB project, uh, but not as strong as like Vanuatu. So from that resilience course discussions, we have learned how we can do more in strategic way and effective program by working together with gender-based violence and psychosocial support and spiritual counseling as a one group, uh, one big support group for the vulnerable people. So for me, this course is very resourceful uh, for the community engagement program, as well as to build a resilience church community in local context. And currently, uh, Myanmar is going through a lot under the double crisis, like COVID-19 and the military coup. So building a resilience church community is imperative at the moment. So all topics from the resilient course are applicable for the current situations in Myanmar and also as well as uh, it also support for the rehabilitations to the displaced community uh, which will come in the future too so for instance adding resilience course in bible school curriculum which i taught uh, in yangon uh, that that will be very enhanced the resilience mindset of the younger generations of church leaders so this online course has empowered the leadership role uh, as we are bring to as we are able to bring across the lessons topics and the concepts to the local church or a small group meeting for example after each sessions we have an assignment to do and on the questions of how the topic enhanced to your church and how uh, how would you do in your context to build a resilience church community so it gives me an opportunity to develop the leadership skill and the facilitation skills uh, in peer group, in local small group too. So by facilitating in Myanmar group with young people, and I gained so much more confidence in myself uh, of the leadership skill. So I have noticed that uh, this course unlock uh, many abandons in women leaders, uh, in women learners, to be and to come up as great leaders with resilience mindset. So the participants of Myanmar group have decided whenever we have a chance to do training or Bible studies in local church community, we will use from the knowledge of resilience course and will change the ideas of old traditions. So to sum up, this online course disturbs the hierarchy culture that are created by gender inequality that used to happen in most of in-person training. And this online course can create a safe zone uh, for more comprehensive integrations of gender uh, into resilience-focused discussions. And this online course can diversify uh, participation and leadership in resilience-focused uh, discussions so that the Resilience Online course is valuable and worthwhile for me.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Snow, for sharing your experience in unlocking your own leadership and facilitation skills by gaining confidence in what you're doing. And the, the resilience course group from Myanmar and how you're looking to move forward. During disaster response, women voices are often excluded and silenced when they're not given participation or considered in determining need, planning, and making decisions for their own lives and that of their communities. Multiple reasons are given why making decision happens in arenas where the women are not present. There are social and cultural norms around who says, who stays home and who is in the public arena. These norms and unspoken codes exclude the voices of marginalized people. Our fourth speaker today to build on what we have been hearing so far is Donna Louise William. Donna, Will you share with us what are the impact of the course on marginalized people, especially in this case, women? How has it been a safe space? How has uh, the, the course been a safe space for participants and especially for women? Thank you, Glenda. I am Donna Louis William from the beautiful Caribbean island of St. Lucia a born and raised Anglican from the Diocese of the Windward Islands. I am from the parish of Holy Trinity Castries, with St. Mary the Virgin Lakai. I have been a teacher for over 30 years, and I'm currently a graduate teacher of Caribbean history and social studies at my alma mater. According to the United Nations Population Fund, a safe space is a formal or informal place where women and girls feel physically and emotionally safe. The term safe in the present context refers to the absence of trauma, excessive stress, violence, or fear of violence or abuse. It is a space where women and girls, being the intended beneficiaries, feel comfortable and enjoy the freedom to express themselves without the fear of judgment or harm. The resilience course was indeed a safe space for women. It was a course where we were the beneficiaries of much needed information to help us deal with hazards, which we know disproportionately impact women before, during, and after disasters in our communities and churches. We felt comfortable and enjoyed the freedom to express ourselves without the fear of judgment or harm. The format used for sharing was very beneficial to all present and facilitated this freedom of expression. We were put in small groups or breakout rooms to share ideas on the topic of discussion for the particular session, and also to share ideas on the Bible's passages associated with the topics of discussion. These small groups comprise of both male and female members. After the small group sharing, we went to the large group where a member of the small group shared the ideas of the entire small group. This was done when we spoke on topics like self-care and safeguarding of vulnerable persons in churches and the society. In the small groups, participants were able to speak the truth of what pertains to them personally and in the church locales when it came to self-care without thinking that it would, be it would have gone out to their prospective churches or that they would be judged on how inadequate they cared for themselves. The truth was also spoken of examples of vulnerable persons in their congregations and the society and the ignorance of or lack of or insufficient concern for them in the churches. This strategy was very beneficial to all, especially those people 
who were fearful of large group sharing of ideas. This made it a comfortable avenue as persons did not know who shared what ideas, which prevented judgments being made. Had it been face to face, the discussions would not have been so fruitful as everyone would have known or seen the speakers or presenters. Therefore, it would not have been a safe space to air your views on topics being discussed. Additionally, this small group or breakout room sharing enabled the members to build trust and open sharing over time. At the time allocated for sharing was not enough as members spoke so openly that everyone could not share in the time given. The resilience course with the safe space it afforded women led to a change in mindset of both genders. Most of us women perceive that our contributions are not important or that we cannot add any value to any topic, group or discussion and so feel inferior especially if we know that some people are more educated or know more than us and are more fluent in the English language. It was not so in the course. My mindset was changed and I realized that my contributions were significant to the group discussion, which allowed me to not be timid or soft-spoken on issues being discussed. I raised my voice and aired my views on opinions without fear of judgment or ridicule or harm. Furthermore, I realized that I may not be as educated as some other participants, but we all were benefiting from each other's contribution. And the course with its interpretation component allowed persons with fluency in, other, in languages other than English to participate fully in the discussions we were learning from each other. This was another benefit of the safe space. We were all on a leveled playing field. No one was above the other based on his or her qualifications, gender or language spoken. We all came here to learn. A member of the group exemplified this very well. He was a priest, works with the Anglican Alliance, one of the keynote presenters, and yet made us feel safe in our small group and listened to our ideas and even presented them to the large group. The mindset of men was changed in that they realized that the women too had their say, which was important to the growth of the discussion as men and women's perspective are different in most cases. And it was important to have a female's viewpoint on some issues, especially those who warranted a female's point of view and some which were effective. Therefore, they did not dominate the discussion, but allowed for a balanced discussion, both male and female's perspectives on issues. The safe space fostered cross-learning from the experiences shared from participants all around the globe. There was a kind of diversity of knowledge. Participants felt so comfortable in the test, in the course, sorry, that they shared ideas and others benefited from the information being passed on, which resulted in increased learning of the participants. It was a real eye-opener for me on the western part of the globe in a small Caribbean island to learn of and hear the gravity of the situation of women in prisons and the inhumane treatment of refugees in Africa, as well as child trafficking and cases of survival sex by vulnerable women. Up to this time, my limited knowledge and experiences just saw it as prostitution on the part of women who could have done better. I must say a big thank you to the organizers of the course for correcting and increasing my knowledge. This learning was not just cognitive, but effective as well. 
This made them more sensitive and understanding to what their fellow colleagues were going through in their respective cultures and societies, which was an added plus for the course. Some of them were able to empathize with their fellow colleagues and provided much needed support and encouragement for the particular issue or issues they were going through. It was God inspired individuals supporting, guiding and helping each other through love to cope with circumstances. Permit me here to share an example. We were in our small group and our male members were absent and a visitor, which was female, joined us for the day. During our group chair, share, sorry, the visitor was at the point of tears when she broke down and informed us of the incident in which she was involved in just the previous week before, while being the face and hands of God by doing humanitarian work in a church, she and her companions were attacked and all their valuables were stolen. Well, as an all-female group, we too were emotional and empathized and sympathized with her and gave her that much needed encouragement and support with prayers and words, which left her, in my opinion, much better than when she came. We all concluded that God had brought her there for this reason, on that particular day. The course did that. God did that. I do not think that the session in the small group would have been this way if the male members were present. The only drawback I perceived was maybe for some sessions, individuals could have been asked whether they wanted to be in an all-male or all-female small group due to the nature of some topics and then have the sharing of male and female perspectives in the large group. Also, we could have had a component where facilitators could have helped persons who needed extra help at the end of the sessions. In conclusion, the safe space afforded by the resilience course enabled participants, especially females, to air their views and ideas in an open, comfortable, and free environment, which break down the barriers of inferiority and timidness, which allowed participants to learn from each other, which fostered a camaraderie of love and care for each other an attribute which Jesus Christ exemplified and also preached among his followers. This was shown among Christians across the globe, thanks to the resilience course. Thank you, Donna. Thank you very much for sharing how the different features of the platform and the format generated a safe space for participants to speak the truth, not feel judgment, and created space for open sharing and trust building. You brought forth also how it allowed for cognitive and effective learning. Thank you. We have heard from the four panelists and our audience has been posting questions to the chat. Now is the time to invite you to share further your ideas and to answer some of these questions that were posed by the audience. So to, to, to our panelists, Our first audience question is, as the world learns to live with COVID-19, do you see us going back to courses like this one in person or will the trend and achievement of the online platform 
continue to dominate. Thank you, Glenda. I would attempt to respond, and then if my other colleagues have more ideas to add, they can add on as well. So, like I said, the COVID 19 has taught us to be more adaptable in these current times. The resilience course, which was planned as an in person training, had to adopt and venture into the e learning space, and we saw that it was doable and achievable since traveling was restricted. Presently, online platforms have served us well and will continue to do so in coming years. However, post COVID-19, I see courses such as this adapting to the new normal, having a hybrid course, favoring both online and in-person training sessions. On the in-person training session, Hours, which is a resilience course, I will highlight or reiterate that it should be local or regional. Learners will have to choose what best suits them. And also course organizers like myself and my other colleagues, we would ensure to um, weigh the pros and the cons of having a hybrid as opposed to each of the ones that we have, which is the in-person or the online, and we will take our decisions from there. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Uh, other comments about um, the either continue, how you see the future in terms of in-person or uh, online or what will happen? And thank you for adding in uh, where you see what about the regional and the local situation, because that is another thing that is on the, in the chat. Uh, uh, Snow, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Glenda. Um, from, from the Asian and, and I mean, from Yamal points of in context, uh, in recent situations and the, and the future, uh, uh, challenges for us. Um, uh, I was thinking attending in person for this online course uh, for the for the course in person uh, would not be possible. So for my answer is more strongly to the uh, the trend and achievement of the online platform uh, which will be offered for this course in the future. Uh, and as I am a teacher uh, in, in Bible school, uh, uh, like uh, Tonga, uh, Tonga uh, Theological College who participate with uh, a group of uh, theological students participate uh, to this online resilience course uh, with one uh, laptop uh, connecting with the big projector like that. So uh, uh, for me is if, this on um, uh, if this course will continue through the online so more inclusive i will say the participants will be more inclusive with the big group uh but we only need we don't need uh uh many computers just one computer with connecting with the projector like that so we i mean for the asians part uh for the uh people, we can participate like that way. And also I see it's, uh, although it's online course, it's, uh, uh, it's more uh, hard to say, uh, people can uh, more direct interaction, I would say, more direct interactions with uh, participants and the facilitators. And the, uh, so, uh, so I like that way. Uh, uh, you can hide your face if you don't want to show other people. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, but uh, mostly uh, facilitators encourage us to show our face. I mean, uh, the more seeing, uh, interacting, you know, people more enjoying. And then so I, I, I see this more direct interactions uh, with uh, in person. I mean, online even is more interactions for me. Uh, 
Yes, and also I will say uh, the other point is we can learn as much as we can uh, through this online course. Uh, so I enjoy, I like that uh, the concept of learning. Um, and also the other is contextual learning method approach that used in the uh, resilient course. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that's, uh, I mean, based on the context, so we can share and experiences. Uh, we, uh, we take what we can learn uh, from the, the other concept, the uh, context, and uh, if it's useful for, uh, and also the concept is a flexibility. Uh, we, we can use that concept uh, through in our own context. So, so that's my point. Thank you. Thank you, Snow. And Donna, you wanted to add some more here? Um, this point? Yes, good morning, Glenda. It's morning for me, very early. Um, both of them are giving up the balance. I'm seeing it in both. And for me, on the Western side, in a little Caribbean island, for me, it's better online. I get to know about what's happening in the rest of the world. And then I know other people's perspective. And then it, that's what the online platform allows. So you could see, get to know about every single person. I think if, as Vesta said, it can be that it's hybrid. And I agree. If you want to join, face-to-face -face, fine, or if you want the online, perfect. But for me, on this side, I would like the online because it makes better sense that I can get to know what's happening and I can interact with different cultures. I like that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mircio. Yes, thank you, Linda. Not to be repetitive, but just to amplify the, the same answer. Also from my Mozambican context, where I'm based, I think online worked very well. Uh, present uh, participation we, we've known from a long time, but the context where we are at the moment with the pandemic uh, taught us that it's possible to go online. And we did a one year course using online platform and it was very inclusive. And I think if we have to do it again, if there's a possibility to go online, we will allow that inclusiveness uh, that we, we, we um, so during the, the, the past course. So I'm, I'm, I'm good for, for online. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, there, there was a comment in the, in the chat um, around the whole aspect of uh, people living in areas where women living in areas that uh, are rural and in the mountains or don't have access to, to the technology. So I think um, that is a, an important element that, that we still need to take into account uh, for future uh, programs. There, there, there are lots of questions in the chat. Um, uh, I would like uh, to invite the panelists, maybe a couple of you would like to speak towards uh, the question that comes uh, around uh, self-care or, or mental health, uh, both self-care and psychological support. Um, there is a question uh, in the chat that asked about uh, if that was, yeah, it's a question from Koromoto. As we look at the consequences of the pandemic is the affectation of mental health. Uh, how did the course focus on the issue she's asking? Um, how did the participants uh, response uh, can you tell us anything around how did this course uh, address uh, mental health issues? Or what were the plans in regards to that? This is for the panelists. Um. You hearing me, Glenda? Yes, we can hear you very well, Donna. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the, the part I really appreciated with the course on mental health was when it addressed mental health from the perspective of self-care, 
those giving or helping with those on the ground. When a disaster hits and you are one of the leaders there to make sure that things are in place, you don't really care about yourself because you are seeing that you have to help whoever and make sure everything is in place. I'm sorry if I'm speaking very fast. I'll slow down, I'm sorry. We have to ensure that things are in place and everything is okay with every single person and whatever has to be put in place is put in place before, during and after the disaster. So when we looked at self-care and we realized that if we don't take a break and care for ourselves, we are hurting ourselves mentally and we, are, and we, cannot, and we cannot do as best as we can if you do not take care of yourself. That, that, that for me was important. And then when the homework was for us to go and carry out some interviews and then I interviewed the PCC group the parish church council and to hear the perspectives and it was very very good and i was able to use what they gave me to do a very good homework and then i realized that it is important that we take care of ourselves if we don't we will not be able to care during a disaster so this is the part i would like to bring out thank you Thank you very much, Donna. Um, I want to move on to another question. How have you seen the assets-based approach of the course empower and impact women? Uh, and, and, and that can be tied um, with a question that Giseche has on the chat um, about uh, the, let me see if I can, yeah. Um, about the, the faculty, uh, the guest speakers, using all those resources that are available in our different countries and community, uh, what diversity and inclusion factors went into selecting these experts? Um, so if you can speak a little bit about this asset-based approach, but also speak a little about kind of the, the selection of the speakers and, and that type of thing. Can you help us with that? I will jump in. Thank you, um, Glenda. So um, for the course, in responding to Chiseche's question, and then I'll hit on to the asset space, um, we were intentional about making sure that we had, if not equal, but more female to speak to us because we wanted to um, promote the inclusivity of females in that space. So um, we, we pair the topics that were selected at the secretariat meeting. Um, secretariat members made sure that we picked people from geographic regions and who knew or had good information, quote and unquote, taking my words carefully, to share for others to learn and replicate in their regions if they had platforms to do so. So we were very intentional about that. In terms of the assets-based approach, we all know that the assets-based approach um, fosters um, or builds on the assets that are in communities or in amongst groups. With the resilience course, we ensure that the assets were not external or outside of the church but what the church had. So we had Mother's Union people, we had um, lay persons who brought to the fore their rich experiences in terms of disaster preparedness and how they responded in their various regions or localities. And from that point, those of us that had and didn't know some aspects also learned from what was shared. And so we replicated it in our own regions. Currently in Brazil, our learners are doing marvelously well with what they have learned from their resilience course. They are now being intentional about identifying vulnerable populations to target in their disaster response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vesta. Anyone else would like to add to that? 
Yes, just to add on that, uh, thank you, Glenda. Um, uh, this course uh, made me realize how rich we are as Anglican Church, as far as people, as resource people we are. You know, very uh, like-minded people with a lot of knowledge to share. And that was amazing. There was a, an atmosphere of, of sharing and learning, and that's really great. At community level as well, um, I will talk in the context of Mozambique when we talk of community based assets uh, as you may know Mozambique is like a corridor of cyclones or natural disasters and from the end of the course up to now which we consider four months we've had one cyclone that hit and we were able to use some of the learnings of the online course in applying for for, for the planning and the, the, the response for the uh, past cyclone that hit us to mean that uh, Everything was done by local people through the DRR committees that were managed to, to be formed. And the, and the online course, the online course leveraged the, the responses that we had along the time. Okay, so uh, it just to, this to say that um, the assets base that we have um, are improving uh, as a result of, of the, this online course. Sorry if I'm speaking fast. I'm trying to think in Portuguese at the same time to express better myself, but uh, that's what I wanted to share for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mercio. A question for, for all of you. Um, as we look to the future, what can be done in future courses to strengthen gender empowerment? Um, and yes, and, and, you know, to continue to give voice to those that we don't usually hear. Can I go? Yes, please go. No. Uh, from Myanmar experience, uh, uh, we have very strong mothers unions group and youth group. Um, so the local leaders and church leaders, they accept uh, women's and leadership skills. But in terms of when we, uh, uh, if we want to give training or awareness for the gender empowerment, they are so sensitive. Um, I don't know why <laughs> they accept women's uh, leadership skill, but they don't accept the concept, the, uh, the ideology or the theology come from that. The idea come from the theology based on the theology. So, um, but when I learn from the the on the, this resilience course, I have noticed that uh, uh, how we can change that perspective uh, from the uh, from our community. So I will say uh, uh, using the uh, how to say. Uh, the, the contextual learning, you know, approach uh, uh, relating with the development uh, concept, a development and resilience concept. If we combine the gender with that uh, resilience concept, uh, I think uh, we, we, we will have a more uh, positive uh, way and positive influence to the uh, men leaders in, in our community, like gender, uh, gender with development, gender with protection, uh, like a gender with, uh, with resilience, like, you know, uh, with not uh, interdisciplinary between gender and the, uh, the, the resilience and development concept. So, so I will say in, in, in my context in the future, I think uh, all these, uh, I, it, it will come together. I think it will be more uh, 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 valuable uh, in our context. So, uh, so through that you know, interdisciplinary approach, uh, we can strengthen gender empowerment and the concept of gender with concept and practical, I would say, uh, using the contextual learning. So based on the practical uh, application. So this two will come together in the future. Thank you, Snow. Any other comment regarding uh, future courses and empowerment 
of women. We have another question. Um, I want to bring this one and probably it will be the last one we can deal with, but um, it says, how do you see the theological and pastoral challenges that have arisen during and after the pandemic to attend to the needs and demands of the communities? Will the virtual modality suffice? In terms of theological and pastoral challenges, uh, would virtuality, would working virtually, that modality, would that be sufficient um, in terms of addressing the needs and demands of the communities? It's an interesting question. Yes, it's very interesting, Glenda. And as one who does pastoral care, um, when the pandemic hit, it was, it was difficult, I must say especially for the aged people in, in, the, in my church, in most of our churches, where they could not come out to church and they could not see each other. And then we couldn't go out to them as well because they were so vulnerable that we couldn't go to them and see how they were doing. So what my church did was that we called everybody we make sure we call them. And then me personally, when I saw, I would just go out and say, hello, how are you doing? I wouldn't dare go into the house. But virtual in this sense will not really help the aged. And probably what we can do, a future course can do, probably when make sure that, and I see it's working in my school, we don't really have connectivity. And they have some devices where you just put some money. It's like the telephone. It's a MiFi device. And then you can just put money on it. And then you can see, probably we can invest. The courses can invest in these things, probably giving, um, if they can probably raise for some tablets and thing and probably send it out there and have a, a center where these people can come and get, and get the course and probably more women will be coming. So they'll come at a certain time and get privy to it. So this can help. But I find yeah. the modality, especially it has to be with the age of the individual. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. Uh, we, I think for questions, we, we have run out of time, but um, I would like to give each panelist 30 seconds, please, only 30 seconds. If you would like to make a last comment about the course, about um, what you've heard from your fellow panelists, you have 30 seconds for a last comment. And uh, let us begin in the same order we work. Mercio, followed by Vesta, followed by Snow, and then Donna. Go ahead, Mercio, 30 seconds. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, uh, I think uh, it's halfway through. We haven't reached the end uh, line of these discussions and of this learning process. So I think we've come this far and we, we are still have a long way to go. What I will say is that may we have more spaces such as this to continue to engage and to leverage our knowledge to better serve our community. Thank you, Vesta. Thank you, Glenda. Um, for me, I would like to speak to the technological perspective. Um, research has said that there's an increase in the number of women studying online in the past decade. However, this has surged during the COVID-19 pandemic time. I encourage all of us, especially our women, to sustain the game and break the status quo. We are affirming our commitments to the theme of the 2022 International Women's Day campaign, break the bias. We can and we will do it. Thank you, Brenda. And thank you all for listening to us. Thank you, Snow. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I will say I am the living examples from the course because at first I am an interpreter and through, I think, uh, Nagulen and Janice, by using the SS-based approach, they saw my potential and the skill and they invite me to participate in the course. And through that experiences, uh, my leadership skill and facilitation skills is abroading. Uh, growing 
And, and from then, they invite me to join in the panel presentation. So, so I have a different steps to come through, but um, so through this online course, I'm very grateful. And also this as a space approach and contextual learnings uh, shine a light on uh, the marginalized woman from Myanmar. So thank you. I encourage thank everyone you so uh, to join if there will be a next uh, courses like this. Thank you. Thank you. Donna. Yes, Glenda. Um, to end, I would just say that the course is indeed a safe space. I remember when I first joined my very first session and they showed the wheel and then they had so many different people on this wheel. I said, oh my goodness, I probably will not get through with this. And I was even thinking of not continuing. But then when Janice and Nagulan spoke to me, I continued and then I saw how fruitful it was and I was not intimidated and then I contributed and for me, it has helped me grow as an Anglican, as an individual. So I'm saying yes to the resilience course and more courses like this one that we are there, God-fearing God individuals building each other, building and working in God's vineyard. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to Episcopal Relief and Development, to the Anglican Alliance. Thank you to our panelists. And thank you to our audience, to you that took time and made and became came here today to be with us. And uh, we invite you to other events that we'll be having, both Episcopal Relief and Anglican Alliance in the future. And if you are interested in the courses, please check and uh, find out where they're happening, when they're happening. I would like for us to end today uh, with, the, with the resilience course uh, video that was made, the message that come from participants. Ang resilience course. We can't prevent disasters. But we can increase our resilience to them. When a disaster hits, being prepared. Knowing how to respond and having resilience all make a huge difference to how a community copes and emerges from the disaster. As Anglicans, we believe that building our capacity for disasters and cultivating our we bring our spirituality into our work inspired by the words of Jesus to, to love our neighbor and, and to recognize the dignity of every, every person we are called to serve. to serve. Since October 2020, over 140 of us from 42 countries representing 23 provinces of the Anglican Communion have been enrolled in the Resilience Course. O curso de resiliência nos permite conectar online com nossos colegas anglicanos. Colegas anglicanos. Para exchanger de conhecimentos sobre a resiliência e a resposta à catástrofe. Discussing topics of the course include climate resilience, coping with trauma, women and girls in humanitarian responses, targeting marginalized populations, safeguarding, le cours est dispensé dans plusieurs fuseaux horaires et en plusieurs langues. É um curso oferecido em diversos fusos horários e diferentes idiomas. The course is offered in multiple time zones and in multiple languages: Arabic, Burmese, 
inglês, francês, português e espanhol. The course is an investment for learners of at least at least three hours per month for ten sessions over a year. And each session, we spend time on Bible studies and listening to best practices related to the faith. Para reflexionar y aprender de unos y unas, de otros y otras, a fin de mejorar nuestra participación comunitaria. Después de cada sesión, desarrollamos nuestras tareas, incluyendo actividades prácticas y conversaciones en línea en grupos pequeños integrados por pares. Nos estamos construyendo una red profesional y segura una red de profesionales anglicanos de confianza en nuestros respectivos países, en las regiones y alrededor del mundo. The Resilience Course is part of a wider Anglican, Anglican initiative called the Partners in Resilience and Response. Ang Partners in Resilience and Response ay hindi lamang nakatutok sa pagpapalakas ng kakayahan ng mga simbahan. Partners in Resilience and Response is not only, is not only about strengthening the church's capacity to respond to disasters and building resilience. But, but also, also about accompanying, about accompanying a church. It's also, also about accompanying a church when it is going through a disaster. We are building a global fellowship of people who are resourced to act as accompaniers to churches in times of disaster. Offering either, offering in -person either in-person deployment or remote support. We love our church. We love our neighbor. Amamos a nuestra iglesia. Amamos a nuestros vecinos y vecinas. Amamos a nuestra iglesia. Amamos a nuestros vecinos y vecinas. Nos amamos a nuestra iglesia. Nos amamos al próximo. We are We lacking are the abundance, the abundance of, collective of our strength. collective strength to have the courage to transform challenges into opportunities, crisis into creativity, and despair into hope. Únanse a nosotros en este recorrido. Júntase a nosotros en esta jornada. Paz y bien para todos. Thank you for joining this webinar.